How does the mind work? Why do the best writers get the most writer's block? Is the process of evolution the key to understanding the development of thinking? Here are some selections from my recent reading list. Number one, How Can the Human Mind Occur in the Physical Universe? by John Anderson. So given the title, you might be expecting this question to be rhetorical, as in, how could we possibly understand something as mystical and limitless as the human mind? Instead, Anderson offers a sincere answer to the question of, as Alan Newell put it, how the gears clank and the pistons go in the human mind. Anderson considers three dead ends visited by psychology, two of which he stumbled down himself. Number one, ignoring the brain. Herbert Simon and Alan Newell spearheaded this classic approach. Early information processing theories waved away questions of how functions are implemented in the human brain. This led to theories that were similar to serial computers, but biologically implausible. Number two, ignoring the mind. Another idea, eliminative connectionism, assumed that we could infer higher order mental processes from the behavior or presumed behavior of networks of individual neurons. To their credit, computational neural networks have worked well as pattern associators. Still, Anderson argues that these networks only model unreasonably small slices of human behavior. Understanding the mind requires integrating human intentions, memory, and step-by-step thinking processes. Number three, ignore the mechanism. Another dead end is to start by just assuming the brain needs to adapt to the real world and then infer cognition based on those constraints. While Bayesian analysis can match the statistical patterns in memory, this path ultimately dodges the question of how memory actually works in the brain. Anderson's answer is ACT-R, his long-developing theory that I've previously reviewed in an earlier essay. His research has attempted to synthesize the contributions of many different fields of psychology to present a reasonable model of how humans think. While some might scoff at the possibility of answering the question itself, Anderson's attempt comes as close as any to unraveling the enigma. Number two, Toward a General Theory of Expertise, edited by Anders Ericsson and Jackie Smith. What makes experts better than beginners? What changes in the mind allow a grandmaster to pick the right chess move, a doctor to diagnose the right illness, or a tennis pro to hit a perfect backhand shot? The study of expertise has produced a host of replicable findings about the differences in expert performance. Number one, novices reason backward, experts reason forward. Backward reasoning is the process of successive goal setting, where you start with your final goal and then work backward to intermediate steps you need to take in order to reach it. Forward reasoning, in contrast, starts from where you are right now and just moves automatically to the end that you're trying to reach. Studies find that experts usually do more forward reasoning, characteristic of routine actions, and novices engage in the effortful backward reasoning of problem solving. Number two, novices see arbitrary pieces, experts perceive meaningful chunks. Experts see complex patterns of information that allow them to reconstruct what they've seen without difficulty. Novices instead see a bewildering array of component parts that they struggle to make sense of. Number three, Novices rely on weak methods. Experts use strong methods. Weak methods are the general purpose tools we use when encountering novel situations. These include heuristics like hill climbing, keep changing things in a direction closer to the solution, and trial and error. Strong methods are domain-specific methods that deal with particular problems. While a host of expert novice differences have been studied, we know comparatively less about how novices become experts. Number three, The Psychology of Written Composition by Marlene Scardamalia and Carl Berite. The standard picture of expertise is that experts reason automatically and fluently, moving from problems to solutions in a straight line. In contrast, novices stumble through effortful problem solving, hitting dead ends as they work toward the answer. Writing defies this picture. Instead, Scardamalia and Berite observe that new writers exhibit surprising fluency, Novice writers frequently begin writing immediately, almost as quickly as they can put pencil to paper. In one investigation, children were astonished when it was told that experienced writers sometimes spend as much as 15 minutes thinking about what they'll say before they start writing. In contrast, expert writers are slow, plodding, and effortful problem solvers. They frequently get stuck, have experience with writer's block, and struggle with writing. Despite this, 
They produce far better prose. So why does writing defy the normal rules of expertise? Scardamalia and Beriter's answer is that novices and experts use different processes for writing. They find that novices use what they call a knowledge-telling strategy. A novice tries to recall as many ideas as possible that fit the topic and the conventions of the writing format. When given a writing prompt such as, should students be able to choose what they want to study, children try to generate sentences that fit both the topic of scholastic choice as well as the overall format of an opinion essay. In contrast, they argue that experienced writers use a more elaborate process they call a knowledge transformation strategy. The expert is working simultaneously in two problem spaces. The first one is of rhetorical issues, so for instance, will my audience find this convincing? And the second concerns content issues, what do I believe about this topic? The back and forth process is effortful, but it results in better writing than is achieved by novices. I found this book fascinating both for providing insight into my own writing process and for offering validation of the observation that I've had that writing has gotten a lot harder for me as I've gotten, hopefully, better at it. Number four, How We Learn to Move by Rob Gray. How do people get good at athletic skills? The classic answer is through repetition. By repeating the correct technique over and over, we eventually perfect our golf swing, running stride, or jump shot. Gray argues against this view, arguing that not only does repetition not work, it isn't even possible. Instead, he argues that motor skills are a dynamic adaptive system. We need variability in our movement and practice to avoid injury and fine-tune our motor coordination. So, I'll admit, motor skills are a lacuna in my general knowledge of skill development, so it's hard for me to judge exactly how mainstream Gray's views are. Nonetheless, I found his ideas plausible, especially given how difficult it is for people to understand how their own body moves. Number five, Parallel Distributed Processing by Dave E. Rummelhart and James L. McClellan. Parallel distributed processing, or connectionism, is the idea that we need to understand how the brain is organized to understand thinking. PDP is considered a landmark book in launching the serious study of computational neural networks. A few general ideas proposed by PDP include 1. Distributed representations. Rather than represent memories or ideas through single tokens or units, connectionism stresses mental representations extended over many neurons. In this way, the coding for the memory of your grandmother, high school chemistry teacher, or Brad Pitt isn't a single neuron somewhere in your brain, but a diffuse pattern of activation over countless units. This distributed representation allows for robustness, but it has drawbacks. The question of how these networks can encode relational properties, for instance, the difference between the dog bit the man versus the man bit the dog, vexes cognitive scientists and machine learning researchers alike. 2. Thinking as Relaxation A challenge of real-world thinking is that it often involves drawing inferences under many ambiguous constraints. Serial information processing models often resulted in an explosion of possibilities, which made them impractical for common sense reasoning. Connectionist networks avoid this difficulty by having possibilities compete with each other for expression. An incompatible idea will suppress another one, eventually resulting in the most likely option. Relaxation of this kind is a major part of Walter Kinch's construction integration theory, which I reviewed in a previous essay. Three, learning through error correction. Training distributed representations is done via backpropagation, where errors are used to adjust the weights of aspects of the neural network in an optimal configuration. This book sat on my shelf for years before I finally gave it a read. My current view is that connectionism provides a better approximation to the intuitive, sensory, low-level aspects of thinking, and symbol manipulation is a better approximation of the rational, cognitive, high-level aspects of thinking. Number six, Emerging Minds by Robert Siegler. Child development has long been characterized by a staircase metaphor for progress. Influential Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget observed that children of different ages used characteristically different approaches to thinking. This tradition has continued in the information processing age with theorists such as Robbie Case arguing that these correspond to discrete increases in working memory capacity. 
Staircase thinking also occurs in theory theories, which propose that young children have qualitatively different representations of physics, psychology, or the outside world that their more mature counterparts have. Siegler argues that the staircase metaphor is wrong. Instead, he says that the field has systematically overlooked variability in cognitive development. Instead of a single way of thinking, what is impressive about people is how many different ways we have of thinking. Children often exhibit several methods for solving a problem and don't inevitably use the best one. This variability has consequences. Siegler argues for an evolutionary approach to thinking. Just as species aren't neatly ordered on a ladder of creation, nor are human mental abilities explained by a staircase metaphor. Instead, wide variety of methods compete and adapt for application through repeated exposure. Siegler has conducted extensive investigations of how children approach problems of addition. He finds that the strategies children use evolve over time. They begin from counting from both numbers, then move on to counting from the larger number, then finally retrieving the direct answer from memory. However, this transformation doesn't occur suddenly. Children use multiple methods whose frequency changes over time as they learn new tricks and memorize the answers. Now, I haven't read enough development psychology to say whether Siegler's view represents a new consensus or a heterodox view. Still, I find his ideas interesting for suggesting that learning skills may involve acquiring completely different procedures at different stages of growth. Number seven, On Problem Solving by Carl Dunker. Decades before Newell and Simon's book on problem solving, Dunker wrote a tight little academic monograph investigating the thinking people used when solving problems. It's from this book that the concept of functional fixedness appears. This is the idea that in seeing an object as having a particular function, you are less able to see it in an alternative function. The classic experiment in his task was to ask subjects to fix candles to a wall, provided a box of tacks. If you put the box separately, most subjects recognize it as a suitable platform and fix the box to the wall before resting a candle on the top. In contrast, if you put tacks or candles inside the box, subjects view the box as a container, and thus very few solve the problem. I'm fascinated by Gestalt psychology. Despite being an extinct lineage in the evolution of scientific psychology, work by Gestaltists presaged much of the cognitive revolution. The Gestaltists were mostly German, and the rise of Hitler forced many of them to relocate to America, where they faced a less favorable environment due to the brand of psychology being behaviorism at the time. If Thomas Kuhn was right, and scientific paradigms are incommensurate and to a certain extent arbitrary, I wonder if 21st century psychology might have looked very differently had history played out differently.